Hello everybody, welcome to another exciting rendition of Legal Issues in Sport. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time, welcome. Hopefully this is not many of you, but uh, my name is Jeff Levine and I'm your instructor for the course. And in this segment of the course, as we finish off week one with this third lecture, uh, we're going to be jumping into things that are a little bit more heady, talking about the nuts and bolts of the legal system. But fear not, um, I know that it could be conceptually a little bit dry, a little bit murky. No one really wants to take a civics lesson uh, that might put them to sleep. So I have a solution for you. Um, I will spare you a lot of the jargon and a lot of the background and instead let someone else do it in a much more entertaining and enjoyable way. So I'm here starting off at our, at our Blackboard page on the Splash page to show you where you can find this information. So you go under content, and by this time, the, uh, this page will be live. So go to week one, PowerPoints in video, uh, lecture videos. Go down to week three, and actually, um, I should go back because um, week one, you've got your little, it, for those of you who have not already done so, you would want to click on this link uh, for the video where I introduce myself and give my song and dance and talk about the course. But anyways, talking about um, the primer videos for the US legal system and a little bit of civics. Um, there's three links right here that are absolutely very well done and short and well put together. They are from uh, PBS, targeted seemingly to millennials and centennials, where it quickly discusses um, key elements of the judicial system that we will be covering somewhat in a little less awesome, uh, less exciting manner. So um, I would absolutely recommend that you guys uh, watch each of these links. Together, it's about 20 minutes, and it, like I said, I think they're fairly enjoyable and entertaining, and you, you might learn something. But these, are the these will serve as the foundation um, for the, uh, the, the, legis or the judicial process. But anyways... Um, I'm not including them in the in this actual broadcast recording because I'm uh, expecting you guys to watch this on your own. And like I said, I think it will be a good time investment. So, okay, getting to the lesson. So, for some reason, PowerPoint kept on crashing on me and killing this video. So, I'm going old school. I'm going PDF. So, we're going to talk about the U.S. legal system and legal research. So, the little agenda here, and I'm not expecting this to take more than 25 minutes. The first thing we start off uh, talking about is the legal system. And then we move on to talking about resources and types of legal authority. And we'll discuss what legal authority is and how it differentiates and the things that you should know as sport managers. And then legal research, fun stuff. So, okay. For those of you who at this point um, are um, interested in watching the video, hopefully you'll pause right here and you'll go watch the first couple of videos because it talks about some of these concepts. So for uh, anyone who took high school civics, this should look similar. Our U.S. legal system is divided into three branches of government, legislative, executive, and judicial. Exec uh, excuse me. The legislative branch is the body that makes laws. They, they are um, composed of the Senate and the House of Representatives. And both at the state level and federal level, uh, these people are charged with writing laws and, and passing the laws as they are the, the body of, uh, of politicians that represent the people, the duly elected representatives of the people. So they create statutes, which are the laws that govern our country, and then they may also amend existing laws based on uh, what is going on in public policy and what is the will of the people. Next is the executive branch, and that is embodied by the office of the President of the United States, currently Barack Obama. He will be outgoing and most likely will be replaced by either Donald Trump or Hillary uh, Clinton, probably not uh, Jill Stein or uh, the libertarian Gary Johnson. Or if you want, you can also vote for me. Uh, you can write my name in, in as a candidate as well, Jeff Levine for president, starting the campaign right now. Anyways, um, the executive branch is headed up by the president, 
And the president's job, along with the rest of the executive branch, is to enforce the existing laws on the books that were duly created, enacted, and amended by the legislative branch. And so the president has different types of authority at his or her disposal. disposal. Executive orders or the power through what are called administrative agencies, which are extensions of the office of the president that assist in enforcing laws on the books. So their authority, the president and the executive branch's job is to enforce the law. And then finally, the judicial branch, which we're concerned about here, uh, mostly since it's legal aspects of sport or sport in the law. Uh, the judicial branch is composed of both federal and state courts, and they are in charge of interpreting the existing laws and seeing if they have been fairly applied or if they are somehow unconstitutional, if they violate the Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. And judges are either elected by, um, by uh, some sort of election, they're appointed by the executive of the state or by the, the president, or um, they somehow, um, well, actually, I think that's it. That's the only two. They're elected or they're appointed. And usually, in terms of the federal, um, judges who are appointed are approved by uh, Congress. Cool. So here you've got some handy-dandy pictures of the executive branch, the judicial branch, and the legislature branch. Now, we're going to focus on mostly the laws of the land in courts. So, as I said, as I foreshadowed before, the Constitution is the, is the foundational document of the United States. It lays out our foundation, uh, foundational rights as citizens of the United States, and every um, state has their own state constitution, and there is one federal uh, constitution that was uh, written many, many moons ago. And the federal constitution trumps everything. It is the highest law on the land, so it beats state law, it beats federal law. Anything that is inconsistent with the constitution will be deemed to be invalid because the constitution is the supreme law. Now, below the Constitution are statutes, both federal and state statutes. And for those of you who watched um, any of the primary videos, um, the host talks about statutes. And they are law that is debated over, voted on, and either, uh, and usually it has to be enacted uh, through Congress, through the House of Representatives and the Senate, whether it's at the state or federal level. Um, that is the second highest law of the land and only is um, uh, trumped by the Constitution. Regulations are sort of not laws, but edicts or guidelines that are created by these administrative agencies that are overseen by the executive. So um, here we've got uh, examples of administrative agencies, as it says right there, they're quasi-legislative, judicial, and executive, um, meaning that they uh, can come mostly from the executive uh, branch, uh, such as the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission or the Securities and Exchange Commission. They're supposed to be in, um, in enforcing the laws. Let's go back here. And then finally, common law or case law, which is judge-made law. And um, we will be spending some time talking about this, but this is basically any sort of decision that is made by a judge who's um, hearing the case. And that judge's decision becomes binding on the people who live in that region or that state. Um, um, okay, we'll talk more. So there's different types of authority. Um, we're concerned mostly about primary authority. Primary authority means that that type of law must be uh, obeyed. So on the right-hand side, you've got common law, and again, that's judge-made law. And on the left-hand side, that's enacted law, which is usually from the legislative or from the executive uh, executive branch. So enacted laws, of course, are, are, legis are from the legislatures, and interpretive decisions are usually from the administrative uh, arm of the executive branch. They're, again, in charge of enforcing the law. And then, like I said before, common law is the judge-made law. Okay.
here's a nice little visual representation of the hierarchy of the law. So like I said, the constitutions of each state or the, the federal constitution, um, that is the highest law of the land, followed by statutes and regulations. Exciting stuff. Here we go. All right. Then um, we get to, we actually talk about courts. Now, for those of you who watched the video, and I'm almost tempted to pause this and try to find the, uh, the little blurb, but trust me, if you are watching the video, you probably saw it, and it was pretty, pretty informative, pretty funny. The, the, the quick sort of rub here is that there's different types of cases. So there's criminal cases, civil cases, and equity cases. But I want you to focus on cr criminal and civil for now. We'll, we'll uh, kind of ignore equity for now since it's less important. Criminal is a uh, type of court where the uh, topic being debated is whether or not the defendant violated a law on the books. And it's... Uh, uh, they're presumed, based on the verdict, to be either guilty or not guilty. And if they are guilty, then they will either go to jail or uh, for a specific period of time and lose their freedom, or they will not. So it's, the stakes are pretty high. Now, with civil, um, it's based off of whether or not the defendant is liable. Um, I should mention, in criminal, the plaintiff is always the prosecution, and the prosecution is always either the state or federal government, They're, and they represent us, the people. So we, if anyone watched the most recent uh, kind of uh, 30 for 30s uh, from ESPN uh, involving O.J. Simpson, that was the people of California versus O.J. Simpson um, because he was charged with uh, murder. Now, civil is a little bit different. With civil, the defendant is a private citizen again, um, but the, the, the plaintiff can be a private citizen as well. You're not going to have uh, usually uh, a governmental entity being the plaintiff. And here, the defendant is either liable or not liable, meaning that the, if they're found to be liable, they usually have to pay some sort of uh, penalty in money damages. And mo money is damages. Uh, but if the plaintiff, or if the defendant wins and is found not liable, then the plaintiff gets no money. And then finally, like I said, kind of ignore this for now, but equity um, is for any sort of case where um, the plaintiff is looking not for money, but for the court to actually make uh, the defendant do something or refrain from something. So when Ricky Williams um, retired from the NFL in 2005 uh, because he was um, caught smoking weed, uh, and fill his drug test, um, he couldn't go to play football in the, C in the CFL or another competing league because he was under contract with the Dolphins at the time, and the Dolphins could have sued Ricky Williams to get an injunction preventing him from playing for anyone other than the Dolphins. Fun stuff, I know. Okay, some examples here. So, under criminal, let's say the plaintiff is, is or I'm sorry, let's say the defendant is tried for armed robbery. Well, if the defendant is found guilty, that means that the plaintiff, or the defendant, if the defendant was found guilty, that means that the defendant, it was found that he was guilty be, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. So basically that the uh, finder of fact, usually a judge or uh, or could sometimes be a jury, jury, found that there was about a 98 or so percent likelihood that the defendant was guilty. But if there's even a little bit of doubt, then the defendant must be found not guilty. Now, a little bit different if, if it's a civil case. A civil case, um, the plaintiff must prove their case only beyond uh, the, the threshold of it's more likely than not. So 50.1% um, like, more likely than not likely that the defendant is at fault. So a much lower threshold. Um, and there we go. Okay. So now that we've talked about the difference between federal and civil court, I'm sorry, uh, criminal and civil court. Now we're going to talk about civil trial process. 
So for those of you watching the video, you would have already seen that the, the process goes a little something like this. A plaintiff initiates a lawsuit by filing, what, filing what's called a complaint, which is a document that he files with the court stating why the court has jurisdiction and why in the facts that led to the plaintiff uh, being entitled to whatever he or she or it is asking the court for. And then at the end, after the plaintiff has laid out the facts and the legal theory, the plaintiff will ask the court for, for something, usually money. Once that's done, the, the plaintiff will file that, and then the plaintiff is responsible for serving that complaint in the summons, uh, which is compels the defendant to appear in front of the judge. Uh, they will uh, serve the summons complaint to the defendant. Once that defendant receives the complaint, the defendant must file an answer, usually between 20 and 30 days of actual re actually receiving the complaint. And in the, in the answer, the defendant will usually respond to what's uh, the, the, the uh, allegations in the complaint, basically saying, I, yes, I admit that that's true, or no, I, I deny that that's true. And then the defendant can provide some defenses as, as to why the defendant's not liable. Once the defendant files his, her, or its um, answer, then discovery occurs, and that's an exchange of evidence that supports the, claim, the, the, the claims and defenses. Depositions can be taken, which is basically taking a, a, a witness or a party to the lawsuit is uh, asked a bunch of questions under oath, and the transcript is created to reflect the, that conversation. And then usually uh, a deposition is created before the trial because the plaintiff or defendant's attorney wants to trap that person being deposed uh, into a line of, of, of reasoning or statements that the attorney will then go back to at the, at the trial to try to trip that person up to make, to, um, make it, them look less credible or something similar to that. Uh, after discovery, um, either a, a settlement happens or a trial happens. And as the uh, video showed, uh, about 90% of lawsuits, uh, or at least a high percentage of lawsuits, settle before going to trial. Uh, in between all that stuff is what's called motion practice. And motions are just um, legal requ uh, requests, written requests, where the plaintiff or defendant are asking the court to, do, to, um, to allow the plaintiff or defendant to do something. So it's, it could be procedural, it could be something about uh, tactics, but that's also interspliced. That you could ask the court once the plaintiff files the complaint and the defendant answers, um, if the defendant uh, is entitled to judgment according to, the, uh, according to the undisputed facts of the case, and if the law supports the defendant, then the defendant can actually uh, can uh, ask the court to award uh, or to dismiss the case right off the bat without the lawsuit. And vice versa, if the facts of the case are undisputed and the law says the plaintiff should win, the plaintiff can ask the court to uh, award it what's called summary judgment, which is that it, they're entitled to win without going to trial. Fun stuff. Okay. In addition to litigation, which that's what that is, uh, alternative dispute resolution comes in the form of mediation and arbitration. And ADR is just a way to resolve conflict and avoid uh, the cost and the length and the frustration and emotions of, of, uh, of a lawsuit, of a trial. Uh, lawsuits and trials are not fun. Uh, oftentimes, both sides walk away from the lawsuit uh, being un unhappy. So uh, in terms of alternative dispute resolution being, um, being used, and, and I should also mention that uh, oftentimes, because a lawsuit's so expensive, uh, what the plaintiff is asking for is usually not even, at the end of it, not worth it to the plaintiff because it costs the plaintiff so much in attorney's fees. So ways to get around that is through ADR, which is much cheaper and much um, um, less, um, uh, less time-consuming. But uh, issues involving player contracts or collective bargaining agreements uh, are often handled by arbitration. Uh, we've seen salary arbitration. Uh, used in baseball and hockey, uh, that's in the that is a uh, ADR method that is uh, helps to resolve a conflict in a relatively quick and inexpensive way. And then collective bargaining agreements uh, often have language in it that says, in the event that there's a dispute to the, um, to 
um, what uh, a an element of the CBA, like if the commissioner believes that he has the authority to suspend a player for not cooperating with an investigation or for uh, engaging in some sort of infraction, infraction that violated the rules of the game on the field, uh, that commissioner might have the authority to suspend that player but can be appealed through um, some sort of uh, arbitration um, um, mechanism. So anyways, okay. Now here would be a pretty good time to consult um, the language of the first primer video, and actually, this, actually, I think it's the second primer video, which lays out um, the American court system. So on the right-hand side, you've got the state court system, and the vast majority of, of lawsuits go through the state court system because um, the state court system is a system of general general legal claims, um, general jurisdiction, whereas the uh, federal court system has a limited scope of what can actually be filed in, in federal court. Usually um, when the dispute, there's a dispute between two individuals who live in different states and the amount of money in controversy is over a specific dollar amount, a high dollar amount, that might be that will be funneled um, uh, oftentimes in the federal court, or if it's a um, lawsuit involving a, a federal law or federal question, an issue with federal law, um, that would also go to federal court. And there's a few other things in there, uh, treaties and, and such, and apparently piracy and the law of the high seas, or maybe that's actually the Supreme Court. So now I'm just getting mixed up all, all over. Consult the, your new teacher, the internet. Just kidding. Don't do that. Um, okay. So on the left is federal court, uh, m much fewer courts than, than state courts. Uh, the, much of the heavy lifting is in the federal court or is in the state courts. You've got your, your trial courts, your appellate courts, and your Supre the state supreme court. And then um, any sort of uh, appeal from the supreme court would go to the uh, supreme court of the United States, uh, which the supreme court does not uh, doesn't need to consider that appeal, but it can if it wants to. But um, on the left-hand side, you start off at your federal district courts, which are like your federal trial courts, then your federal court of appeals, and then the Supreme Court. So uh, for a bit more detailed and more enjoyable explanation, the, the primer should probably help you with that. But as you see, the federal circuit map shows that um, the court of appeals, each court of appeals in the federal government is, divi is divided into uh, 13 uh, circuits. And... Um, you can see on, on the map here that the circuits uh, are laid out in geographic location. Um, the Ninth Circuit is the largest on the right, or on, yeah, on the left, um, and it, it's the most liberal. And the, the, the circuits, uh, the, the Federal Court of Appeals in the South, are usually more uh, conservative. Um, each Court of Appeals is, has a panel of three judges, and each trial court is just one judge. And the Supreme Court traditionally is nine judges, although currently at the time of this recording, uh, there's eight judges because one uh, judge's seat is vacant due to the uh, untimely um, death of Supreme Court Justice uh, Scalia. Okay, possible actions of the appellate court. And before we even say that, I should say that the trial court's job is to make a baseline initial decision on either... Uh, uh, the, the law or the facts based on what the plaintiff wants. But the a, anyone can appeal a lawsuit, and based on that appeal, you know, did the judge misinterpret the law, or did the judge, did the jury um, not understand the jury instruction, or did they come to a legally impossible um, um, conclusion? So the uh, appellate court can affirm the decision of the lower court. Lower court says the lower court trial court was correct. It can reverse the decision in, in its entirely to say everything that the court came to is wrong and we're going to kick it back to them with instructions of how you can fix it. Uh, or the appellate court will remand the case back with specific instructions for one element that they might have made a mistake. Fun stuff. Okay. <sighs> Authority. And where do I find it? So you remember... We've got primary authority on the left, and that's the constant. That's state. That's state and federal law or court decisions. Um, and then what constitutes uh, secondary authority is anything that is trying to interpret or explain the law. That could be law reviews or articles or books. So, 
primary legal sources, Constitution, statutes, regulations, court decisions, fun stuff. Secondary, right here, um, like I said, anything that's helping to explain or interpret the law. For your purposes, really the only thing that you need to know is that this, these sources exist and they would be helpful um, if you ever get into a position where you need to have knowledge of the law, which is probably most every managerial or professional position. But a lot of these sources are free and you can just Google them and they will help you to uh, discover them. So your goal as a manager is to use these resources to um, conduct legal research. But actually, I think I skipped something here. Did I? No, I did not. This is the next part. Sorry. Okay, so why am I talking about this? Well, like I said in the first um, presentation, the law permeates everything that we do as a society. Most uh, Sometimes we, we don't even realize it's happening. So your job is to make sure that you're able to have a baseline awareness of the law and sometimes you might need to go a little farther by understanding how to do preliminary research on legal issues and based on that preliminary research whether or not you need to seek out legal advice so um, the underlying un uh, awareness and understanding of how the legal system works can help with that and then uh, it would be helpful uh, once you can make an initial determination of, a, of whether or not a legal issue exists, then you can consult a lawyer to help the company or organization as to how to navigate this legal issue. Um, this also ties into a preventative law approach, which we talked about in Chapter chapter 2. For those of you who have not watched it, you might want to go back and do that. Um, and you want to consult a lawyer to help with drafting legal documents such as contracts or engage in risk management planning or helping to select helping um, to select insurance as a way to transfer or avoid or mitigate risk different types of risk not just liability but reputational risk uh, environmental risk uh, institutional risk regulatory risk all the risk and then finally you it's important to have a working understanding of the basic legal issues that are more probable than not that your organization will face and then trying to um, avoid those issues. All right, so binding versus persuasive authority in the doctrine of stare decisis and precedent. So precedent, this refers to examples where a one court decision is handed down. They make a dis they come to a conclusion. That person is guilty or innocent. That, that entity is liable or not liable. And then based on the similarity of the facts and what level court Subsequent cases m are governed by the prior court's decision. So if there's similar facts to uh, if a, a subsequent case comes and it has similar facts to uh, a case that was previously decided, that future case, uh, that, that judge in, in the future case must um, follow the prior court's decision where the situation or the facts dictate. And this is called uh, stare decisis, that courts are fo to follow the president precedent and not disturb a point of law that is well settled. Um, it bring, helps to solidify and bring certainty to court decisions in a way that encourages predictability and does not force legislatures to have to redesign the laws. So, all right, I know you're probably tired of me talking, so I'm going to just play this a little bit of this guy right here, and he'll also clean up all my messes here. So this will also help with precedent. General Supreme Court precedents are binding on future Supreme Courts, too, because of the principle of stare decisis, which is Latin for let the decision stand. This doesn't mean that future Supreme Courts can never overturn the decisions of prior courts. It's just that they try very hard to not do it. This idea of precedent is one way that judges can be said to make laws. Appellate decisions are like common law in that they're binding on future courts and constrain their decisions and because they don't have to be grounded in a specific statute. Other courts have to follow the higher court's interpretation of the law, and this interpretation has the effect of redefining the law without actually rewriting the statute. On the other hand, appellate decisions are technically not common law and that they are only binding on courts, not executive agencies or legislatures. They are, however, signals to courts. Remember, we talked about executive agencies and legislatures. What was the executive agency again? What, what type of uh, agency is that? Type of function is it? Yes, administrative and enforcement. Good job. And legislative does what? Yes, 
It makes the laws. Good work, team. Courts and legislatures about how courts will rule in the future. Maybe an example will help. If you watch cop shows or you get arrested a lot, you probably know something about Miranda versus Arizona, which gave us the Miranda warning. You have the right to remain silent and all that stuff. Hopefully you've never heard that in person, though. But hey, we're not here to judge. That's what the courts are for. <laughs> all right, maybe, maybe I'm In that weird. case, the Supreme Court threw out Miranda's conviction because he hadn't been told that he had the right to remain silent. Without knowing that he didn't have to talk, he made a confession that got him convicted. The court didn't rewrite Arizona's law, but it sent a signal to Arizona's law enforcement agencies and those in all the other states that in the future, courts would throw out the convictions of defendants who hadn't been informed of their rights. As a result, police procedures changed in every state, and now the police are supposed to read the Miranda rights to anyone they arrest. So those are the very basics of judicial review. We've probably... All right, we're done here. All right, we're going to go back. Where are we? All right, we are here. No, we're not. Where'd you go? Oh, I know where you went. Come back. Come back to Daddy. Uh-oh, that's not right. No, oh, no, I'm stuck. Oh, here we go. <laughs> All right, so precedent, stare decisis. Remember that uh, courts uh, must follow a prior established case law um, up when it's similar facts. All right. So what, can, what th three things uh, do courts consider in determining whether or not a case is binding and persuasive? They look at the jurisdiction. Is it a case that came from the same state or same, uh, same um, federal uh, jurisdiction? Is it the same level? Is, did it come from the district court, the trial court, or the appellate court? What about the issues? Are the issues the same or are they the similar? Is the question is it a question of whether or not it's legal to marry my cousin, or is it uh, whether or not I can marry my cat, or whether or not I can marry someone who's a different religion? Are these issues similar or analogous? Question. Facts. Are the facts the same? Are they analogous? Are they dis distinguishable? All right, let's try one. Yay! All right, let's look at this. You represent the Art Institute of Chicago. In a suit it filed in Illinois against a moving company that poked a hole in American Gothic, this guy on the upper left, when transport plan, uh, transporting the, plant, the painting to an exhibit at the Speed Museum, which is in Louisville, Kentucky. The Art Institute seeks money damages for damaging or for the damaged painting. There is a prior decision from the Illinois Supreme Court where a moving company was ordered to pay damages to the Louvre after it seriously scratched the Mona Lisa, that guy right there on the, on the right, when it was being moved during an exhibition in Illinois. So the question becomes, is the prior decision binding, meaning the court must follow it, or is the prior decision persuasive, meaning the court can consider it, but not necessarily come to the same conclusion. So let's look at the jurisdictions. All right. We are in Illinois. Filed the lawsuit in Illinois right here. And then the prior decision is also from the Illinois Supreme Court. Since the Illinois Supreme Court is in the jurisdiction of Illinois, we have the same uh, jurisdiction. So that's good. Is the issue the same? Whether or not... Um, so the issue in this case is whether or not the transporting company is liable to for the damages, and the prior decision was whether or not, surprise, the moving company was also liable for damages. Yes. Facts. Are they same, similar, analogous? What do you guys think? All right. I think you're right. I think it's the same jurisdiction issue and facts, and so this case would be binding on the court that we are in right now. The court must follow that case. All right, and I will leave it for you guys to decide whether or not this is a similar case. You represent a client who was seriously injured when a speeding boat operated by a drunk skipper ran over her boat. The accident occurred in Kentucky. There is a Kentucky Supreme Court case where a speeding car operated by a drunk driver ran over another car, seriously injuring the occupants. Is the prior decision binding or persuasive? Since we cannot debate this in class, I'll let you guys think about that and think about where the, these um, cases might be similar and where might they be different and where you think that you'd come out on this. So, all right, kind of finally here, um, if you are, if you go back to the managerial approach and you are looking to do some legal research, some cursory legal research, 
there's some five steps that would be important. Identify the specific issue that you need to research. So if it's from a preventative law standpoint, um, what are you actually researching? You know, uh, liability for your organization for a slip and fall. What's an athletic trainer's potential liability for um, not not uh, rendering aid that was up to uh, what is required for athletic trainers in that state? Um, if a, a PE teacher... Um, loses control of their class and one student ends up hurting another student in class think about that then you find the relevant law and remember that law can differ whether it's um, a federal statute the constitution a state law a regulation uh, is it a court decision is it binding or persuasive hopefully these words um, ring a bell hopefully they they ring a bell read and summarize the law what, do you, what does it mean what do you think it means well, what's the uh Takeaway, update the relevant law. Has anything else changed? And organize the information you have collected. And then you also want to see a lawyer, uh, if need may be. So mercifully, that is it. And hopefully, uh, you guys have stuck with me this entire first week. Hopefully, it was enjoyable. Hopefully, um, you didn't get tuckered out. And I imagine you're multitasking or doing something. But uh, I hope that you got something out of it. Uh, I promise that um, things will get a bit more interesting as we move into the next um, chapter uh, and series unit, uh, which is going to be looking at um, sort of the managerial aspect of uh, hiring and firing and contracts and a bit more juicier things. But I think the, the course will get a bit more enjoyable for you. Um, but I, like I said, um, please check Blackboard regularly. And um, make sure that you know what you need to do in terms of assignments and quizzes and postings. Um, please come and see me if you can. I'd like to meet my students. I really would like to get feedback as to what you think about the video so far. Never used this technology before. Um, I usually just like to have conversations with my students in lecture. Um, it's tough to do so at this point. Anyways, um, I hope you guys have a, had a great first week. And... Uh, Great weekend, and uh, oh yeah, probably should say office hours. Office hours, um, I said it in the initial uh, video, but I'll say it again. Uh, Tuesdays 1 to 4, but most any time otherwise by appointment. All right, that's it, and I'll stop talking, and then everyone will probably be happy with that. All right, take care, everybody. Pause.